Hey everybody, what's up? Um, glad y'all can join. Um, we are looks like we are officially live. So um, happy Wednesday! Hope everybody's September is off to a good start. Um, got a little bit of bourbon in my glass tonight. Um, starting with a little bit of Elijah Craig, but. Uh, as the title states, I am recently back from Ireland in the UK where I was able to pick up a couple different things, um, which we can uh, talk a little bit about tonight. Uh, but some of it's from Duty Free, some of it's directly from distilleries. And um, looking forward to chatting with you all, hearing a little bit about your experiences with Duty Free and, uh, you know been to any of the distilleries over in Ireland or otherwise. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that as we get going, but, uh, oh, cool. Looks like we got somebody on here already. Hey, French, how you doing? Nice to see you again. I think you were here the last time I was here. Pouring myself some Macallan 18. Wow. Man, you're living large on a Wednesday. Good stuff. Um, yeah, so uh, I had a really good opportunity to uh, visit a couple places. I'm not much of an Irish whiskey drinker. Um, in fact, it's probably one of the, the uh, types that I know the least about. Um, but, uh, you know, with the addition of like, or with the exception rather of Red Breast um, and a couple of the spots, I was able to actually taste a decent amount of different Irish whiskeys while I was over uh, for a couple days in Dublin. And also had the opportunity to uh, try a couple things at a couple different uh, bars and uh, and whatnot that I stopped at both in London and in um, and in Dublin. Mm. But this bourbon that we got going so far is actually working out pretty well. So I think I will probably pour one of these tonight. Um, but uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. I think. It's really hard. It kind of it's like burning a hole in your pocket when you get yourself some new stuff, especially when you're coming from overseas. Um, most of these things are things that I can't find anywhere here in the states, um, and some of them I know are travel exclusives. So uh, it was a cool opportunity. I think in hindsight, um, one of the lessons learned was uh, to set myself up in a way that I could have actually brought more home. Because um, really, what you find is especially in the duty-free shops, if you if you find a good one, which we'll uh, get into, that, uh, you know, you got to you gotta make sure that you have enough uh, luggage with you and everything like that just to be able to bring the stuff home with you. But I was able to bring home a couple of cool things and uh, I look forward to both opening them up relatively soon and then uh, sharing with you all uh, my thoughts on those. I'll probably post some review videos about them uh, in the next couple of uh, months and so. so. Um, so cheers French. I uh, hope you're enjoying that McAllen 18. That's actually one I've never had. And to be quite honest, it's, it's something I've always found to be a little bit outside my, uh, my price range. I don't think I can find a McAllen 18 for, uh, really for less than God, 200 bucks, 230 bucks. So you enjoy that. Um, that one's been on my list to share. Christopher David's here. Good evening. everyone. Hey, Christopher, how's it going? I hope your Wednesday's going well. And, uh, your September's off to a good start. Thanks for stopping by tonight. So, you know, we'll get into these in just a couple minutes, but, you know, first thing in general, um, for those of you who have been, uh, had the opportunity, you know, to travel from the States over to uh, either London or Dublin, um, you know, I'll just get this out of the way right away. This was a trip that I unfortunately did not have the time to actually get to go to Scotland. Um, I was in London and Dublin exclusively. So unfortunately, that's going to be a trip for another time. And uh, it's definitely one that I'm going to take. But I did not get the chance to uh, to head up and check out some of my favorite distilleries up there. That's for sure. Um, but, you know, um, some interesting stuff you can find around in London. That's for sure. Uh, there's no shortage of good single malts. Um, there were a couple of real cool bars I got to stop in, and um, I did get to finish uh, visit the famous Whiskey Exchange in London and uh, brought something back from there as well, so we'll talk about that. Uh, Whiskey Searson, what's up, buddy? How are you? Drinking a Weller SR, smoking a Padron 1964 Maduro. Cheers, everyone. 
damn, y'all are really having good Wednesdays over here. We got some. We got French sipping a Macallan 18. Whiskey Snearson's in the Dweller. Is the SR that's the um, the special special reserve, right? I don't remember. Um, I think that's a special reserve. Uh, I don't know too much about cigars, unfortunately, but uh, 1964. It sounds like it's uh, got to be a pretty good one, considering it's um, considering it's got an age on it like that. Uh, I'm assuming that's the style and not the actual age of the tobacco in it, but I might be wrong. Uh, maybe you can enlighten me on that. Um, Christopher David uh, is very nice, which is very solid. One of my favorite go-to sticks. Right on. Yeah, cigars are uh, not something um, I know a whole ton about. I used to be smoker well um i guess i still consider myself one to some degree but i haven't smoked had a cigarette in upwards of well uh nine weeks now so um you know powering through that as much as i can and uh leaning on the vaporizer for the for the opportune times when i'm having a couple drams and, and need to have that just going but um i haven't had too much experience with cigars although you know i constantly see whether it's in facebook groups uh that are that are designed specifically around scotch or whiskey uh, folks really are uh i think it, it's one of those combinations like peanut butter and jelly so um might be something i gotta get into i'd love to hear if you guys have introductory cigar ideas um there might be something i'll try at some point in time but you know i've had a few in my day here and there but it just hasn't been anything i've gotten too much into um and i'd be interested if you uh you know how you pair them too um I know that you know bourbon and cigars have not you know go together really well. A lot of folks have specific ones they go to with specific, with specific bourbons, but I'd love to hear about that if you all have any uh, any opinions on that. So I was in London for the course of about was there for about four three days three and a half days, and then did Dublin for about three days or about two and a half days. And in London. Um, I did get the opportunity to visit the the whiskey exchange, which if any of you have ever had the opportunity to go to, will totally understand. But for those not, it is as advertised. It was probably the most amazing whiskey shop I've ever been to. They had, you know, in addition to pretty much everything that you'd be looking for, um, they had they had some glass cases with Macallans from the 1930s and 1940s that were like <laughs> 300. No, more than that, it was like 35,000 euros. I think there was one from like 1938 that they had that was like 35,000 euros. Um, just some incredible bottles. I mean, it was just a, a, a treat just to be able to look at them. Uh, not anything, of course, that uh, I'll ever be tasting in my lifetime, but super cool that, you know, they have stuff like that. They had old edition of Lefroig's, which is, you know, my favorite, pretty much my favorite distillery. They had Lefroig's, really old labels going back to the looked like the 1980s at least potentially younger than that and just a ton of different stuff um some stuff that i think you can find readily available in the united states and other things that you know i've just seen a few a few other folks on whiskey tube talk about but never really was able to find bottles of um so one of the things that was you know interesting and not surprising is just the difference between scotch and uh bourbon prices over there um you know here in the states obviously you know scotch comes at a, a much higher premium cost compared to bourbon but over there it's of course just the exact opposite and it's always just kind of funny seeing some of the prices they had on some of these bourbons there was a place i went to in dublin that had a eh taylor um small batch and they were selling it for it was like 130 euro which in american dollars would be like 145 bucks which was just amazing for the small batch so, um, yeah, some of those bourbon prices, they were pretty outrageous. I, of course, really wasn't shopping for them, but it's always fun to take a look. And the scotch prices, I thought, were, you know, at least in the shops I went to in London, relatively eh, 5 to 10% cheaper than the average price you'd find them here in the States. Um, a couple of them, I think, were actually posted at pretty good deals. Um, but... You know, at the Whiskey Exchange in specific, they had, I mean, just an incredible collection, but they had at least, I think they probably had a couple different 18s. They were still selling the Lafroy 18 on the shelf, which I thought was pretty impressive. And it was about 130 euro. So, um, hmm, I mean, I think in US dollars, it's like 145, 150 bucks. Maybe it was a little bit more than that, but 
amazing to see that out in the wild. That's just something you never run into. Every bottle of Lafrag 18 that I've ever been able to get my hands on, I've picked up on the secondary market. So it was pretty amazing to walk in there and see that sitting on the shelf. Like, you know, and they had a whole bunch of them too. Um, oh, CRC says, uh, the Thousand Series by Pedrons are a great start. Rum is my pairing of choice. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of rum. I don't have a whole lot of them. I think most of the ones I have are, you know, relatively basic. I have a, uh, I have a bottle of the, oh, what is it now? Run, uh, the Diplomatico 12, which I know is like a pretty, pretty much standard entry one that folks get. Um, and then I have the Ronza Coppa, I think it's the 23 Solera, uh, which I like quite a bit, but trying to expand a little bit on those. Those kind of are similar in profile, really kind of sweet, uh, kind of molasses-y forward. Um, not a lot of spice. Um, I like them. I mean, they're good sippers. I think they're definitely good introductions, but uh, I don't, I haven't got much beyond that, so I'm going to be looking into that kind of stuff. Snearson says, what kind of the mini selection? The mini selection was quite good. At the Whiskey Exchange, um, it was pretty impressive. I mean, they had mini bottles of uh, Highland Park 12, Talisker 10, um, and just, you know, huge selections of them. I think, I didn't see anything that I thought was really unique to find in a mini. I think they might have had some Highland Park 15s from them, if I, my memory recalls, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, the mini selection was great. I mean, it was, you know, something you wish you could find in the U.S. where they would just have mini scotches. I mean, here it's like you find, you know, a Dewar's White Label or, uh, um, you know, sometimes a Bun Livet 12, you know, stuff like that. But they just had a, pretty much all of your standard um, standard flagship releases from distilleries. They basically had mini stuff at the Whiskey Exchange. Um, the picture I posted on this uh, at the beginning, which will show up when you all uh, check it out later, is actually a picture of one of the walls there, which I thought was... Uh, just shows you the, the the scope of this place, which was it was amazing. It was two floors. Their cellar in the bottom was completely dedicated to scotch, and it was it was floor to ceiling um, scotches and stuff like that. So it was really incredible. And and they had I think two or three tables set up that were just filled with minis. Um, so while I was there, I I was a little bit pinched for time. I probably could have spent upwards of five hours just sitting in there taking it all in. But I ended up coming home with is Lechag 18. Um, so this is one that I've never been able to find in the U.S. Um, this is batch number three, and they were selling this for about 88 euro. So this ended up being about 94 bucks. So $94 I thought was a steal for pretty much any 18, and the Lechag 18 is something I've never been able to find. So this one is, uh, this is what I came home with from the Whiskey Exchange. And let me just pull this bottle out here and give you the specs on. So this is what the bottle looks like. It's definitely non-chill filtered, natural color. Um, this is the 700 of the 70 CL bottle. Yeah, it's 46.3%. It is, yeah, it's finished in Spanish sherry wood. So this, uh, Le Chag, if you're not familiar, is out of Tobermory, uh, Tobermory Distillery. This is their peated line. Um, I think this is going to be a real treat. I'm a real big fan of the Lechag 10. I think for a lot of folks who, uh, if you're fans of Food Quig and you know that he sings the praises of the Lechag 10 a lot, um, and that's what exposed me to it. But this Lechag 18 was the one that that really stood out to me for the price. Um, I think this is going to be a real good one. So I'll be doing I'll be doing a review of this relatively soon. So this is what I came home with from the um, from the whiskey exchange over there. So this should be a really cool, a cool bottle. I have not been able to find this too many places in the States. In fact, I'm not sure if I've ever seen it in the States. They also had another Lechag there. It was like a, it was, like a, it was a non-age statement. It was like a, a sherry finished one, um, which I thought was pretty interesting. But this is one I opted for. That one was like 35, 40 euro more. So um, I went with the Lechag 18, so this should be pretty cool. Uh, let me just catch up on the chat. Don Holland, hey, what's the Sneers and Gents? Don Holland, man, nice to see you. Um, Christopher David, is Lechag 18, 18 travel exclusive? No, it's not a travel exclusive. So I actually, I bought that at the Whiskey Exchange, the Whiskey Shop in London, and I was able to just throw it in my uh, in my bag. So the, 
the U.S. customs rules, which we can talk about in a little bit, are, are a little ambiguous and strange. Um, I highly recommend if you go overseas to have a bag that you check because if you have the check bag, you can kind of throw as much stuff in there as you want. I, I think that they allot for five liters and, you know, you got to declare what you declare and they'll make you pay duty on anything over, well, anything over one liter. But yeah, the, they didn't ask me how much I had in liters. They just asked me how much I had spent. So uh, I ended up not having to pay duty on anything, which was nice. But I definitely recommend and something I'll be doing the next time I go over there is to bring uh, to bring over a, a check bag that I can you know store multiple things in because um, the duty free situation you can buy again you can buy up to a liter without having to pay duty but when you declare it at customs they um, you know they can make you depending on how much you spend you know end up having to pay taxes on it so it's, it's a little bit ambiguous I think that the best way to go is the check bag approach and you know grab three or four bottles if you have it maybe maybe more if you want. Um, but just keep in the back of your mind that depending on, uh, depending on what they say to you when you, when you, uh, go through passport control, uh, you might have been having to pay duty on it. But yeah, long and short of it is the Lechega 18 is not a travel exclusive, but, and I don't think it's not available in the U S I've just never seen it. So I'm pretty excited to, uh, to get into that. And, and like I said, this is, this was an 18 year old. I thought for the price, this was just something I was going to walk. I, I was going to leave that place with. So I'm really glad I grabbed it. Uh, Don Holland says, hey, Don, oh, uh, Christopher David says, hey, to Don Holland. It's nice to see you, Don Holland. I'm glad you could join us tonight. Snearson says, great choice, and hello to Don Holland. Have you had this one, Snearson? I'd be curious if anybody here has had the Lechang 18. Um, I'm not really sure what to expect. There's actually, you know, I was, uh, after I came home, I was going through YouTube to see if folks had done a lot of reviews. Not a ton of reviews on the Lechang 18, so I'm not sure if this one is flown under the radar, or uh, maybe it's just not one that many people have thought to pick up. So it should be pretty interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Christopher Davis says, I have had the 18. Oh, right on. Well, I hope I, I hope I made a good choice, Christopher. <laughs> Searson, uh, Searson says, yeah, just the 10, and I love it. Yeah, I love the 10, too. The 10 is one of my favorite peated whiskeys. I mean, it's not heavily peated, but it's... Um, I don't know if I would you characterize it as a good introduction to Pete? I'm not sure. I think it might be might be an introduction. Maybe it's a little bit sharp. I don't know, but it's kind of like right in that right in that sweet spot. But I love it, and it's at a good price. I and mean, you can find Lechega 18 for you know 55 bucks, which I think is totally worth it. It's really good. It's surprisingly complex. If anybody's uh, anybody here loves Pete Scotch and hasn't had a chance to try it, I definitely. Oh, because oh, okay. So you you have not had the eighteen. Okay, yeah. You know, um, I'm gonna just throw it in. So, WineSearcher.com is a really great website um, to just search for stuff around you know shops around you to see what they have. I'm gonna put the the Chegg eighteen in here just to see if it comes up with anything. Okay, so it is somewhat available here. It's kind of within the 150 to 170 range. It seems like it's relatively available, so not exactly as uh, difficult to get your hands on as I expected. But it does look like you can find it at a lot of shops, and depending on what state you live in, you can get it shipped to you. But it's uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, the price I got it for still seems like it was a little bit lower than I expected or compared to what I'm seeing here for the U.S. prices, but... Uh, you you can get your hands on it, I think, uh, depending on where you're at. So that's cool. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's what I came home with from London. After that, I went over to Dublin and I did two, I visited two distilleries. I did the first one I did, um, was Jameson, uh, the, the Bow Street, the Bow Street distillery which is the one in Dublin. Um, and Jameson, so I got to know how I would, the best way to describe the experience there, I mean, it was, it was quite immersive. They had a lot of cool stuff. Um, their whole bar setup was really amazing. I mean, you can definitely tell that they've spent a lot of money. It was pretty, it had a relatively corporate vibe, but it's still pretty cool because it was Jameson. The thing that I noticed though, they didn't have much, I guess I would say really, 
exclusive stuff that you can only try at the distillery. I found this to be kind of a phenomenon a lot at bourbon distilleries. I had the opportunity to go do the bourbon trail back in June. And I found that by and large, most of the distilleries I went to kind of had the same stuff you could get anywhere else. Every once in a while, they had a few other little things. Um, but the Jameson didn't have really, they had some of their older age stuff, but they really didn't have anything that you can't find at the shop. The only thing that they had was this one. So I just decided on to, to hell with it to pick it up. This is the Jameson Distillery Edition. So this is one, and they got a little stamp on it that you, you know, showing that you bought it from the distillery. It's the only, they, you can only buy it at the distillery. Um, but I don't quite know what to expect from it. Um, it's bottled at 40%, which is not super exciting. It was about 60, 60 euros, so probably around 67, 68 bucks, which is a lot to pay for, you know, in my opinion, for a 40% whiskey. But here's what it says. It says our distillery has been, our distillery edition has been bottled exclusively for visitors to our home at Bow Street, Dublin. It is whiskey of exceptional depth, balancing pot still warmth with sherry wood to reveal notes of ripe fruit and fig with subtle vanilla and chardo characteristics. Okay. That's basically all that they give you on this. Um, and I guess what I would say is I was a little bit disappointed. And the reason being is I had done a little research beforehand and had heard that the distillery edition you could get at Jameson was a 12 year old. And so when I went in there, I was, I looked right for the gift shop. I went into the gift shop and was looking for this 12 year old Jameson distillery edition, which was not, did not exist. Um, maybe they just don't have it out anymore, but this is the one that they had. So I do like Jameson whiskey in general and I decided I would just grab it, but uh, I don't know what to expect out of this. I thought it was a pretty cool souvenir. Um, but unfortunately, either they had a 12-year-old in the past and just don't have it anymore or just don't serve anymore, or um, it was just 12-year-old and wasn't a distillery edition. I'm not quite sure. But this is what they had. Um, I'll probably uh, open this relatively soon and do a review, and we'll see what comes out of it. But I'm not super optimistic it's going to be anything amazing and that it's mostly kind of just uh, branded marketing stuff to get you to buy an over overpay for a 40% a whiskey at their, uh, at their distillery gift shop. That said, um, it was still a really cool experience. Definitely worth visiting. Um, I mean, what can you say about Jameson? It's they had a really cool bar. They had good cocktails, um, plenty of Jameson and, um, and stuff from just Mitchell and sons in general. I did get the opportunity to try the red spot, uh, which hard to find here. It's the 15-year-old of the Spot series. Um, not as easy to find here in the U.S., but it's all over the U.K. and London. And like pretty much every bar you go into had Red Spot 15, uh, the 15-year-old. Um, and the Jameson Distillery had all the all of them. They had the green spot, yellow spot, and red spot. So I get I did get to taste the red spot. It was it was incredible. Um, I'm a huge fan of the yellow spot. I'm not quite sure if I would say it was better than the yellow spot. Um, the yellow spot's 12 years, I think. Yeah, 12 years. But it was everywhere, and I got the chance to try it, which was fantastic. But the bottles were super expensive. I think Red Spot everywhere over there was like 130 euro, 140 euro. It was just like, I'm going to wait until I find it on a shelf in the U.S., I think, because that price was just a little bit much. Ah, right. So Snerson says, I have seen the DE here for around 200 in California. T.E. Is that Lechag Distillers Edition? Oh, wow. Interesting. If that's what you're talking about, that's super interesting. Um, I don't know if I can say I've seen that. Cool. Christopher David, is that an NAS? Yeah, it is. So the Distillery Edition from Jameson is an NAS. Um, like I said, I, I think at some point in the past, they had done a 12-year-old Distillery Edition. And... Uh, before I went there, I was kind of looking to see, you know, what should I pick up if I go to Jameson? And I had seen some folks who had wrote reviews about it a few years ago. I was like, okay, 
okay, so I got to grab this. And we got a 12 year old distillery district for Jameson. This will be super cool. But when I went in there, that's all there was. All they had was this um, NAS version. So I don't know. Uh, I was a sucker and bought it. So we'll see what happens. I'm sure it won't be bad. Probably not. Um, a couple other ones that I got to try that I thought, you know, was stuff I couldn't find in the U.S. was um, the Lafroy PX. So I love Lafroy, probably my favorite distillery. Well, the PX is a, uh, it's the one that's finished off in the, in the Pedro Jimenez cast. It's a non-age statement, but it's bottled at 48%. Um, I was able to find that at a couple different bars over there and finally got a glass and it was, it was as advertised. It was really amazing. The thing that was a little bit unfortunate about it was they were selling the Lafroy PX at the whiskey exchange, uh, which I thought was interesting because it's a distillery or it's a, it's a, it's a travel exclusive from what I understand. And so I didn't buy it, but unfortunately I wish I would have because uh, when I was going through the Dublin airport, the terminal I was in had a duty free shop that um, unfortunately really disappointed. I was, uh, I was going through with full intention of getting the new Lagavulin 10, which I saw was just put out into duty free. I figured they'd have that. I was going to get a Lafroy that I've not had before. Um, and they didn't have it. They didn't have either. The only Lafroy that they had at the, the duty free that I got stuck in was the Lafroy Four Oak, which I've got the last time I was abroad, and I actually did a risky review of, which is not worth your money. Um, and then they had something called the Lafroy eighteen ten or eighteen fifteen rather, which was it's an NAS. Um, it didn't say a whole lot about what it was about, um, but the unfortunate thing was. It was like 110 euro, even in the in, even in the duty free shop. So I just passed on it. I, I was like, it didn't seem like it was worth it, and I was a little bummed. I wanted the PX cast. Uh, so what I ended up getting um, was this uh, two things. Oh, I should also mention I did I did bring home something from Tealing. I'll tell you about Tealing. Um, at the duty free shop, I ended up coming home with Talisker Dark Storm, which is basically the Talisker Storm, but it's matured in, I guess, heavily charred oak casks. Um, this one's bottled at 45.8%. I think this was about 58 euro, uh, one liter bottle. Um, so this one's pretty exciting. I think this is the one that we're gonna drink tonight. And I also got um, the Tain from Glen Morangy. And this is part of their Legend series. So kind of like the the private editions that they put out each year is kind of an annual release in the U.S. I guess they do the same thing in their in their travel exclusives. It's called the Legend series. Um, this one has an Amontillado sherry cask finish, which really intrigues me. Um, this one was about 63, 64 euro, so you know closer to seventy bucks. It is an NAS. Both of these are NAS, um, but I'm looking forward to trying this because I think. I'm a big fan of Glen Morangy. I think Glen Mor I've probably had more Glen Morangies than anything else other than Lafroy's. And for the most part, I've loved all of pretty much every one that I've had. And so this I thought would be something kind of cool and unique to try. So I'm looking forward to getting into that. Um, but yeah, it was it was a little disappointing because I, I really expected that the duty free shop would have a lot more of what I was looking for. Um, specifically that like, so many of these things that come out and I was in such close proximity to London and Scotland, but um, the Dublin airport's duty free shop uh, was not as amazing. They had an abundance of Irish, tons of tealing, red breast, but not at prices that were, you know, so compelling that you were going to run out and buy them. Um, but so the duty free experience was a little disappointing. Um, Really, really wanted to get my hands on that log of Lumen 10. <laughs> I literally had read about it like three weeks before I left and was like, okay, I'm getting this for sure. And the Lafroy selection was just awful. There was this 1815, which I think might be like the travel exclusive equivalent of the Lafroy lore. I just wasn't gonna pay 110 euro for it. It just seemed, or 100 some euro for it. It was just, it just seemed like it was too much for something I didn't know enough about. And so. Um, maybe the next time around. 
Sneerson said, London or Dublin, which did you enjoy more? Dublin. Dublin for sure. Um, they both have their, their merits. You know, London, I had been to London once before, so maybe this is, that taints it a little bit, but London is a really, really big city insofar as like navigating it. it it's a huge area. Um, I think it's a cool place. You know, there's no shortage of obviously of history of you know, iconic sites to go visit. Um, the food scene there, you know, uh, is surprisingly amazing. I think I went to a Thai restaurant, which is probably the best Thai food I've ever had. I went to an Indian place that's Indian Pakistani place to be specific, which is right up there. It's one of the best I've ever had. Um, prices were okay, but everything is, you know, even with the pound at the, you know, right now is, I think it's like a buck 20 or it's 80 cents on the dollar. So, you know, the exchange rate isn't awful right now. And I think it's mostly due to all the shit around Brexit. Last time I was there was like a buck 70. So it's not the worst time to go to the U to go to the UK if you want to um, get the best bang for your US dollar. But, um, you know, I think if you've never, for anybody who's never been to London, there's a lot to do there. Um, but a little bit on the pricey side and, you know, it, it is a distinctly, you know, Western city. It feels a lot like a US city in certain ways. Um, and while I haven't got to explore the whole city, which, you know, would take you weeks, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's worth checking out at least once in your life for sure. Conversely, I think Dublin was, Dublin was a lot of fun. Um, Dublin had a bit more of a, uh, a working class vibe, a bit more of a like kind of a, a blue collar aesthetic. Um, even the touristy areas, Dublin also was a little pricier than I expected, but um, you know, the, the Irish, the Irish pubs that you imagine exist in Dublin with, you know, nightly Celtic music, it's as advertised in that respect. Um, you've got a couple of really good distilleries there, um, including Teeling and Jameson, uh, tons of history. Ireland is, is really easy to navigate. I was actually able to, uh, hop a train right out of Dublin and go down the coast and check out the cliffs and kind of see the natural beauty of the island, which is amazing. Um, apparently it's not much bigger than the state of Indiana here in the States. So, you know, you can kind of travel around there relatively easily. And um, it was just a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, if I had to choose one place to go out of the two, I would say Dublin is the, is the one to go to. Um, plenty of whiskey bars, plenty of, uh, you know, just pubs in general, obviously Guinness, you know, if you're into that kind of thing. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to go to the uh, the famed Guinness storehouse, but um, you know, maybe next time around. I was there just long enough to tease me into wanting to go again. So uh, I'll definitely be visiting again. Uh, weather wasn't bad either. I mean, so this is early September. It was like, you know, overcast with 60s still. It doesn't get super hot there, but I can imagine going any later in the year. It might be a little bit cold for, you know, walking around the city and stuff like that. So. Um, Christopher David said last month while traveling back from overseas, I passed on the dark storm in favor of the PX or Paltney travel exclusive. Ooh, I'm interested in your thoughts on that dark storm. Yeah. You know, I'm going to pour some of this dark storm in just a few minutes. PX or Paltney, man. Ah, I got screwed, man. The scotch collection at this, at this, uh, duty free shop was really disappointing. If I was smart. You know, when I, when I landed, I, I flew into London Heathrow. London Heathrow had all of the things I wanted. I walked through it just to take a look, and they had Lagoon 10, Laphroaig PX. They had a couple different Laphroaigs um, that I'd never even heard of. It would have been really the way to go. I should have just bought it in there and figured it out later. But um, the London airport seemed to have a lot better. Uh, duty free shop in Dublin did, unfortunately. Unless you're an Irish, of course, in which case um, they had a ton of tea links. And stuff like that. So I'm going to actually, um, I'm going to pour a little bit of this dark storm, I think, and then uh, I'll tell you guys a little bit about my experience at tea link. I started off, I actually got these pretty cool tasting glasses from tea link. Unfortunately, I did not get to uh, get to, I got to the distillery super late and didn't get the opportunity to do the entire tour. Let's see here. Uh, it's going to make these things so hard to peel off. Hmm. 
that pop. All right. Here we go for a nice jam of this. All right, so here we go. This is the uh, Talisker Dark Storm. Um, bottled at, oh, I think I said, so this is bottled at 45.8%, kind of like all the Talisker, so that's super cool. Uh, here's what it's got to say. No whiskey is more true to the place of its birth than powerful maritime Talisker. Made since 1830, besides the shores of Lockhart Port on the wild, remote Isle of Skye. Imagine tasting a mighty storm at sea, and you have Talisker Dark Storm, a single malt that takes the intense whiskey experience to a new level. All right. Its rich flavor, dramatized by careful cast selection. Talisker Dark Storm is matured in heavily charred oak casks to invigorate the palate with a whole ocean of spice and smoke. Bottled at premium strength, 45.8% ABV, Talisker Dark Storm faces you with all the wild, untamed spirit of the full blown storm at sea. Travel retail exclusive. So it's interesting that they say Talisker Dark Storm is matured in heavily charred oak casks to invigorate the palate with a whole ocean of spice and smoke. I didn't really ever think, yeah, I mean, it says it here too, a deep, dark, and rich talisker matured in selected heavily chode ca charred casks to give you extra spice and smoke. I mean, so that's it's kind of funny, right? Because like oak char on a cask wouldn't influence the smokiness necessarily, especially if it's peated like this. Because Taliskers are all peated relatively somewhat, so not sure what they're trying to say there. Um, it doesn't say what type of casks. It's probably ex bourbon, extra spice and smoke. So the other thing is like dark char, get more charring. Would that necessarily make it more spicy? It could make it more kind of you know caramely and smooth. Um, I don't know. Well, in any event, I needed to come home with something peaty, and Talisker Dark Storm is what it's going to be. So um, here's what it looks like. This is, uh, there's no mention of natural color or non-shell filter, so I'm assuming that its color's been added and it's been shell filtered. Definitely smoky way smokier than, than any of the Talisker's I've had before. I'm trying to think now. So I've had the Talisker Storm, I've had the, the 10 and the Distiller's Edition. Um, so this one's actually kind of reminding me more of the Distiller's Edition with like Pedia. The Distiller's Edition I find is like really, it's got like kind of an intense fruitiness to it, like dark fruits. Um, and I think it's like PX or something like that. This one kind of reminds me of that, but it's a little sharper. Hmm. Stearson said, uh, caramel and smooth is exactly what I was thinking. Not some BPS marketing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Um, Hey, you know, I like this is, that brings up a really good point. Stearson, and this is something that I've, sort of been thinking a little bit about since I walked through that duty free shop and since um, to be honest since the last time I went through you know like these travel exclusive whiskeys I can't say I've ever I've, I've only had a few so it's a small sample size but I'm really unsure as to whether or not um, they are worth your money even with the quote duty free range cost not having to uh, most of the ones I've had, so the, the ones I had last year, uh, I had the Laphroaig Four Oak, which I was a big fan of the Laphroaig Triple Woods. So I'm like, Four Oak? Hell yeah. It was like European oak, sherry. Sure. It, like, it was awesome. It was 40% ABV. It, it was two-tone. I mean, it was, it was a two-trick pony. It was like, you got smoky ash, and then you got like, 
really like sugary. And that was it. It was really disappointing. Um, and then I had the Bunahaven Krukvana, which actually was a, was pretty good. So I was like, okay, you know, kind of one for two on the travel excuses. Um, we're going to try the Dark Storm now, and then, you know, I'll probably do the Tain some other time, because I don't think I want to do it after I try the smoky stuff. But um, I'm curious, you know, with your experiences, any of y'all watching who have, uh, you know, ran, run the gamut of the uh, of the travel exclusive duty free shops, like your overall impression of the of the whiskeys that you pull out of there. Like, is this just an opportunity for them to sell stuff to folks who are, you know, maybe not super knowledgeable, just trying to get through, uh, get through the shops and, and buy a couple things to take home and maybe don't know as much about it. So these, they think they can get away with, you know, selling an inferior stuff or are there some out there that are super legit and that, you know, the duty free is just another way to, um, luckily get your hands on some really good scotch. I'd be curious, you know, what your experiences have been like. Christopher David, I uh, love whiskeys aged in over-charred casks or toasted finishes. That's what had my interest. I wonder what a comparison to the storm is like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I can tell you, you know, what I'm smelling off this, it does remind me. So that sharp, salty, Talisker peatiness is there. I get, I get the peat, I get the brine, and then I get heavy vanilla, which is coming through a little bit more now that it's been sitting in here. Vanilla. And then there's like a, yeah, I mean, dark chocolate. Dark chocolate and fruitiness. It's relatively decently complex, but the, but that heavily charred oak thing makes me think of a barrel proof bourbon that's been aged for a decent amount of time. That's what it makes me think of. And I'm getting some of those notes on this. I can tell you already, this is at least on the nose. It says promise. Um, I uh, I thought the storm was good for the price. I'm not the biggest fan of the Talos Group 10. I know that's controversial. Folks love the Talos Group 10. I, Talos Group has been a distillery. It's taken me some time to warm up to. Um, the distillers edition, wow, that's the one that kind of put me over and, and made me want to try more Talos This one... This has got to be ex bourbon. I mean, they say it's just charred oak. I don't know what that means. But um, Christopher Davis said all three travel exclusive plantains are worth it, in my opinion. Yes. Yeah. So that's a great point. Like, I, I was hunting for the straight from the barrel. Like, the straight from the barrel is one of the best bourbons I've ever had. Um, the gold is amazing, too. They didn't have any of them. They didn't have any of the plantains in the Dublin Duty Free. I was just like, come on. They had a bunch of Jack Daniels stuff. They had like, God, what are the bourbons that they had some Knob Creeks, but it was like no blends. No. Really disappointing. Next time, I think I'm just going to figure out a way to fly to and from Heathrow because I'm telling you that Heathrow, uh, that Heathrow duty free shop is loaded. <laughs> I might just fly there for that and come back. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give this a taste now. So this, okay, this Dark Storm is pretty good. That's peatier than any Talisker I've had. Peatier than the 10, peatier than the Storm, smoky. Really smoky. Not like Laphroaig smoky, but it's up there. Huh. So that, that what did they say? Matured and charred casks is what it says up here, which basically says nothing. Um, where did they say it here? Heavily charred casks on the bottom. Um, hmm. Yeah, I've got to assume that's ex urban. It, it has all the hallmarks. So it's got the it said like dark chocolate note, that coffee the kind of talk, coffee dark chocolate thing. Dark Storm's pretty good, y'all. Seriously. 
this is uh so it's the one liter bottle it was like 60 65 euros i think something like that it's a little pricey i'd still go with the distiller's edition over this i think it's more complex it's more interesting but this is this is no slouch they might have actually done a pretty good job with this one. <laughs> it's still got that like talisker, that bite, that pepper, that peppery bite that you get out of talisker is, is there. It's briny, sweet with some fruit. This ain't bad. Cool. Right on. All right, so Talisker Dark Storm. Not sure it's worth the price, but it's good. So yeah, I'd be curious if any of y'all have had anything that you've pulled out of a, uh, a duty-free shop in the past that, that spoke to you or, or that conversely, you know, has tainted your view of duty-free shops. I'm really unsure what to think of them. Um, I'm unsure whether or not these are like you know, you they presented it like this is a good price. This isn't. This is a good price, and it's an, an exclusive whiskey that you can't find anywhere. But is Talisker Dark Storm something I want to go out and pay a hundred or, or uh, um, seventy bucks for at the store down the street for a non-age statement Talisker? Like, I'm not so sure. Um, it is a liter bottle, so like, might be worth it, but. I still think, you know, the Talisker's I've had, and again, Storm, 10, Distiller's Edition, and the Distiller's Edition is better than this. And the weird thing about the Distiller's Edition Talisker, it's unlike a lot of other distillery or Distiller's Editions, you can get that one for like, sometimes in some places like 70 bucks. It's really fairly priced. It's not like the Oban, which is 100 bucks, the Lagavulin, which is like 110 bucks. Hundred bucks. Um, for some reason, the Talisker Distillers Edition is really well priced, and it's fantastic. Um, I point in that direction. But this stock, this dark storm is no slouch. I'm actually a little bit. I'm I'm, I'm happy with this. I really am. Mm. It's like a dark fruit thing going on in too. Yeah, it's pretty decent. I'm going to be interested to see what happens to this as it opens up. Um, this is a catch-up on the chat. Christopher David said, uh, all three travel exclusive plant. Okay, the Blantons, yeah. Man, the straight the Blanton straight from the barrel and the Blanton's gold are the two I, the two of those that I've had. I've not had the green. Those are all awesome. They didn't have any of those at the Dublin uh, airport, which is a real bummer. Sneerson says, Christopher David, there has been some really amazing toasted cast finishes in premium Canadian whiskey lately. Unfortunately, not available outside Canada. Uh, I'd love to hear about those, though. Um, there's a couple different toasted casks, bourbons that I've had in the U.S., specifically the Michter's toasted. They had a toasted rye and a toasted bourbon. Um, I had the opportunity to try the bourbon, which was really, really good. Uh, I'd be curious to hear what you've, had, you've got your hands on, Sanderson. I'll have to grab the dark storm next time. I do enjoy the 10 and the DE, and my favorite is the 18. Oh, man, yeah. You're speaking my language on that one, Christopher. Um, the 18, I have a bottle of, but I haven't opened it yet. Um, I have heard nothing but high praise for it. Like I said, I had a I had a tougher time getting into Talisker, even liking peated whiskey. Talisker just, it was too peppery. It just, it didn't quite do it for me. Um and so I think it was maybe the one, it took up an upwards of three or four times of having the 10 before I was like, oh, you know, 10's not bad. And then I was gifted a bottle of the distiller's edition by a friend who knew I liked smokier scotch. So I got my hands on the 10, or pardon me, on the distiller's edition. And I was really wowed by that. The distiller's edition was incredible. I, if I recall correctly, it is, you know, it's ex bourbon and ex sherry. It's just, it's really, really complex. It has, it has everything you'd want 
with the pepperiness that that kind of pepperiness you get out of Talister 10 and and even out of the storm is is a, at least on the one I had was a bit more controlled and it kind of just had a nice mix of all of the flavor ranges you get out of Talisker, but with this, you know, very, very prominent sherry note from that. Um, that was just, it was a special bottle. I luckily, I went out and bought another one because like I said, I, for some reason, the Talisker Distillers Edition is something you can find at a really decent price. Uh, so I recommend it. I really recommend that. And honestly, if you're traveling abroad, this Dark Storm is pretty good. If you can't find the Distillers Edition anywhere close to you, and you're on an airplane coming back from somewhere back to the U.S. sometime. You won't. You won't be. You will not be upset with this dark storm. I'll do a full review of this sometime. But tentatively to say, like this is, this is actually surprisingly good. I wasn't quite sure what to expect, and I thought this storm was good. I thought that the. Uh, I was a little bit unsure what it was about because the storm struck me as like an, like an NAS version of the 10, but I found it, it was like $32. So I had to try it. Um, and I thought, so I thought the storm actually worked out. I'm going to pour a bit more of this dark storm actually. And no lie, it's really great to have these leader bottles. <laughs> leader bottle, man. You get 25% more. So 60 bucks. 65 bucks American for the leader of the Talisker Dark Storm. That would put it at around what? 40, 45 range for the, uh, if you bought this at 750 mils. So not too bad. It might have been a little more than that. It was like 65 euros. So it's like more like 70 bucks. So it's still a little bit less. But, um, this will be an interesting one. I think that with a little bit of oxygen over time, um, I might actually see if I can find a bottle of the storm and do a side by side comparison. Um, it's good. Cheers. Digging it. All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience at Teeling about the opportunity that I didn't get to take, but, um, I will share a little bit about some of the things I tasted there and, uh, why I was really impressed in that if you go to Dublin and you have to do, you have to do one distillery, I think Teeling is the way. Uh, but first, let me catch up on the chat. Uh, Christopher David said, what are your thoughts on Lagavulin, and where would you rank them on either the series based on your palate? Oh, man. Um, so the Lagavulins that I have had, I have had the Lagavulin 12, the Lagavulin 8, the Lagavulin 16, and the Lagavulin Distillers Edition. Um... I liked all of them. <laughs> I liked all of them. Um, the Distillers Edition, the 12, I think, was the best one that I had. But the 12 is also, like, I, I didn't buy a bottle. I actually I tried it at a bar. It was stupidly expensive. The bottles are, like, $130 of it. The Distillers Edition is great because I think one of my favorite profiles is um, the heavily peated whiskey, the heavily peated Isla Scotch with the sherry finish. So Lagavulin Distillers Edition is a great example of it. Or Beg Ugadal is another great example of it. Um, that combination where you get this, um, you know, uh, Lafroy Triple Wood is another example, where you get this really great heavily peated smokiness in the front end and then it kicks at the end with like a nice sweetness from off of like a PX sherry or just sherry cask in general is just primo. So Lagavulin, I like the I love the Distillers Edition. I love the 12. The 16 is good. Um and the 8 is good. But I do find that their stuff is a bit more earthy. It's a bit more vegetal. It's a bit more mm, cloying than the ones that I like a little bit more off of, specifically Lafroy and Ardbeg. If you if you gave me the choice of a Lagavulin 16, an Ardbeg 10, or a Lafroy 10, I think I would choose Lagavulin last out of those three, just because 
when I go for a peated scotch, I like it to be kind of full powered. And I find that the Lagavulin 16 can be not only hit or miss, but also it's it's got just a little bit less going for it in terms of that peaty smoke. So I'm not hating on it at all. I think it's a great whiskey. But also for their that being their core range release, I mean, I personally think that when, when thinking about a whiskey or reviewing a whiskey, that cost matters. If I go into a liquor store and my choice is an art bag 10 for you know 46 bucks or a log of 16 for 68 bucks like i'm going with the art bag almost every time so i like i like log of and i think their distiller's edition is the best thing that they put out outside the 12 uh, which i think is just too pricey uh, but if you can get your hands on it for less than 100 bucks for 100 bucks to do it um the eight is it's fine um and the 16 is good, but it's just it's just not something I'm grabbing every day. So that's kind of where I'm at on Lagavulin. Um, most of their other stuff, I know that they do some special releases and stuff. I've never had the chance to try any of those. So. Um, yeah, that's basically where I'm at on it. Um, Sneerson says, it will be interesting to see how the storm opens up with time. Any barbecue char notes? It's a good question. Not really. I don't really get the char kind of deep um, oakiness off the nose. The nose is quite sweet. Fruity, vanilla, and then the, the, the peat smoke. I don't get a ton of oakiness. I'm, mm, now I'm not trusting myself because now that I've thought about it, I'm wondering if I'm searching for it in here. I didn't initially, so we know that. No, it's it's sweet. It's it's the sweetness. It's the peat. You get it. You get a little bit of it on the palate. I think. So initially on the palate, it's pepper, sweet, smoke. But as it develops, then the char kicks, and then that like the heavy vanilla, caramel, dark chocolate coffee thing comes in, which is what I associate with like heavily charred oak. It doesn't kick in right away; it, it hits as it develops. The finish on this is actually, I'd say, medium. This isn't bad. I'm actually pretty happy with this. Um, Right on. Donner Pass is in the house. Hey, Donner Pass, how you doing? Hey, everyone from Lake Tahoe on vacation family. Just wanted to say hi. Glad you guys go whiskey shopping. The source. Oh, man. Nice to see you, Donner. Hope you're having a great vacation in Tahoe. So much. Good to see you around. Christopher Davis says, what's up, brother? To Donner Pass. Have a good time on the lake. That's awesome. It says, Sneerson. Christopher said, man, Lagavulin 12 is so good. Yeah. Lagavulin 12, man. Is that cast strength? I don't recall if it's a cast strength or not. Whatever it is, that is, that's some seriously good juice. And like I said earlier, I was really bummed because I expected to walk into this um, duty free shop and find this new Lagavulin tenure. They're doing an age statement whiskey travel exclusive. And so I was expecting to walk in and find this in the duty free shop. And, uh, they only had Lagavulin 16 in there. I was like, what is this, man? Especially because I'm in a Scotch group on Facebook called Scotch Addicts. Like, literally, like three days before I had left, somebody had posted about being in the London Heathrow Airport and finding the like a display. They had a whole display of this Lagavulin 10 odds. So I was like, I know it's going to be in Dublin. I'm not going to, no, no, nothing to sweat about. Nowhere to be found. So that was kind of a bummer. So, let me tell you about Tea Lake. So, uh, as I mentioned, I, I got in there at the very last minute, I had, so I didn't get to do the tour. But unlike Jameson, um, Tea Lake, which is like a, apparently a family-owned distillery, they do things the right way. Man. Um, unlike this Jameson Distillery Edition, which I showed you earlier, which is at forty percent, it's 
likely chill filtered. It's likely uncolored. The I, I sat at the bar at the Teeling Distillery, and the Teeling they had their distillery edition. They were selling bottles for sixty five euro. I didn't buy one. I regret it, but I tried it, and it was forty six percent non chill filtered natural color. Really good. Um, it was a mix of pot still and grain, but you could really tell that there was pot still whiskey in it. It was rich, it was complex. I was really impressed with it. They were also selling the other teeling stuff. I, the only other teeling I'd ever had was their single grain, which I think is pretty good. Um, they were selling their pot still, which they've done a couple different batch releases of. They were selling their single malt. Unfortunately, the single malt they were, <laughs> because I got there so late, they were all out of minis of the single malt because that's the one I wanted to buy. So what I ended up with is a, a, a mini of their small batch. So I don't know if any of y'all have had the t small batch before. This is what it looks like. Um, I'm looking forward to opening this and trying it soon. But what was also cool is they had casks um, they had casks in the, in the gift shop that you could fill bottles with and, or fill a glass with and buy. I had the opportunity to try a single cast healing sherry finish, which was bottled at 60, it was like 60.4%, which was awesome. Um, it didn't have an age statement. But it was amazing. They also had a range of teelings that you could buy samples of at the bar. They had a 33-year-old teeling, a 23-year-old teeling, tons of stuff. And this, unlike Jameson, which I said felt like it was it was cool to experience, um, it was a little bit more corporate. This place was a little bit grittier. Um, really wish I could have done the tour. I think if I ever go back, I will do the full tour. Um, but they make just a great product at teeling. And I definitely recommend it. They, I think they also had a 12 year old, um, a 12 year old Irish that you could buy. Teeling was great. Um, I definitely would check it out. And if you, you can buy some teeling stuff here in the US anyway, so I would recommend it if you get the opportunity. Um, that sherry, that sherry finished stuff, um, man, if I could have got a bottle of that, I would have. Uh, but unfortunately, um, all I came back with is the mini, but uh, when I go back and have time to do a proper uh, full-on whiskey tourism, Teeling is going to be a place I stop again. I'm not sure I'd go back to Jameson. So, uh, oh, Searson says it was proper 12, popular over there. Sorry. <laughs> so that's a good question, man. Um, I went to a healthy amount of <laughs> Chris, Christopher David Dahl. I went to a healthy amount of pubs. Um, I didn't see the proper 12 at any of them, to be honest with you. And I mean that seriously. I don't think I saw it anywhere. I think they had I'm trying to think. I think one place had it. But most of the places it was Jameson and Bushmills. And the green spot, yellow spot, red spot. Those three were um, the most prominent whiskeys that I found, that I found at any of the pubs that I went to, and I probably went to at least you know upwards of almost a dozen maybe that I stopped into. Um, some places had um, oh, I can't remember the name of it now, but there's like a peated Irish, and some places had you know whiskey menus that had more uh, smaller local stuff that can't really find anywhere that most folks probably wouldn't have heard of, including myself. Um, but I don't think I saw it. Proper 12, that's the, forgive me, is that the uh, Conor McGregor? It's the Conor McGregor one, I'm pretty sure. I didn't really see that anywhere. Um, I don't think I saw that. I'm trying to think, especially the last place I went. I don't think they had Proper 12. A lot of Bushmills. A lot of Bushmills. A lot of gyms. Um, those were the most, yeah, those are the most ubiquitous. 
this by far. Christopher David said it's probably marketed to stupid Americans. <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, you know, that guy's like the pride and joy of Ireland or whatever. Um, I've never even had this stuff. Have any of you guys had it? I'd be curious to hear if it was any good. Like I said, I mean, I'm... Oh, I should also mention. So in addition to the Bushmills red spot, or the Bushmills, the spots, and the, and the Jameson's uh, red breast is the other one. Red breast was everywhere, which is a great thing. I think I, red breast 15 was literally at every bar I went into. You could get a glass of red breast 15. Um, there was no shortage of that stuff going around. So you had the opportunity um, to try pretty much everything in the red breast range. Um, in fact, the Jameson distillery, which again is owned by Mitchell and Sons, who owns like half the uh, maybe more than half of the Irish distilleries, James, um, they were serving all the red breasts. There. You get any of those you wanted. Um, they had the red breast, they had the spots. Um, it was all great. Christopher Davis said, I did not care for the proper tone at all. I, yeah, like I said, man, almost every bar I went in Dublin, I'd be, I'd be remiss if I said that. I don't think I saw the proper 12 anywhere. Ah, Eric Waite's in the house. Cheers, Eric Waite. How you doing? It says, you need to get some gray in your beard. It will make you look distinguishing. <laughs> what do I look like now, man? Am I just incredibly undistinguished? I got a little gray in the hair. It'll come, I'm sure, sooner than later. <laughs> I would take a standard Jameson all day long. So just read, hey, man, I don't hate on standard Jameson at all. So the Jamesons that I had there, I actually, so I tasted a couple a couple good ones. I tried the Jameson Crested, which um, it's got just more of this of the pot still in it. And then I think was finished and had a little bit of sherry. Um, I tried... They had the Jameson Black Black Barrel, but they had a cask strength version of the Jameson Black Barrel at the distillery. So I, of course, tried that. Um, that was fantastic. I wish I could find Jameson Black Barrel anywhere around here. Um, so, or Jameson Black Barrel cask strength. You can find the Black Barrel. Here. So I tried that, and then yeah, I mean, you know, standard Jameson, you can't go wrong. I'm not sure what to expect out of, like I said, out of this Jameson Distillery Edition. I'll take one more look at this. I don't know what. I'm not sure what to expect out of this. Like I said, all it says on it is it has exceptional depth, which makes me think it probably won't. Uh, balancing pot still warmth with sherry wood to reveal notes of ripe fruit and fig with subtle vanilla and oak. So does that just mean that, like, it's regular Jameson that's just been like finished for a little bit in sherry casks. I don't know. And it says it's got pot still in it. I actually don't know the, the makeup of the regular Jameson, but I'm assuming that there's probably some pot still in that and some sherry in that. It's not all grain. It's not single grain. I don't know. We'll find out soon enough because I'm going to open this eventually. Um, along with this beautiful Leche 18. Which, in hindsight, I probably should have grabbed something else while I was at the Whiskey Exchange because I, the Lech Egg 18 is a little bit easier to find here than I thought. But well, still got it for a decent price. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, and if it's anything like the 10, it's going to be amazing. Eric Waits. Oh, people, folks saying hi to Eric Waite. Christopher Whiskey Snearson. Eric Waits says, I'm in Texas visiting wineries and distilleries, dot, 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 and working. What kind of work are you in, Eric? Does it have anything to do with distilleries and wineries I hope so Christopher David and Whiskey Snearson said you get a warm hello from Eric Waite and Eric Waite says I've got a half bottle of the Joe Magnus for drinking over the next couple days in my hotel I mean, 12 bucks what the Magnus from DC I feel bad I lived in DC for three years I never had any of the Magnus stuff 12 bucks <laughs> Eric Wade says I'm a porn star and underwear model. <laughs> you said the quiet part loud there. You had all caps the porn star. You should have just said you're an you should underwear model and <laughs> we get it, man. We know you're into some stuff. I'm glad that you're around, buddy. Slancha. Hope you're having a decent time in Texas. Where are you exactly in Texas? Houston, Austin? Hopefully not San Antonio. <laughs> San Antonio is uh 
Well, what can you say about San Antonio? Anyways, um, so I'm giving the tentative thumbs up to the Talisker Dark Storm. The rest of these are going to be a little bit on the wait and see, but I'm assuming probably going into next, early next year, I will have opened all of these by then. The rest of my schedule for videos this year is already pretty much planned, but I'll probably sneak in this Talisker Dark Storm so I can do a proper review of it. Eric Waite says, I was in Austin last week. We'll be again this week. I'm in San Antonio during the week. Ah. San Antonio. Um, maybe you know the good spots there, but I, my time uh, visiting there, I was, was kind of not super impressed with the city. But I'll tell you, it's just ridiculous what the prices you're getting, though. I didn't realize things were that cheap in San Antonio. Yeah, exactly, Christopher David. Wow, 12 bucks is fantastic. At the distillery, they charge $40 for things. Yeah. Why did they even have Magnus at your hotel? Like, what is it, in your mini bar? It's such a weird thing to have there. That's not a that's not a whiskey you find, you know, sitting on the shelf at your average hotel bar is Joseph Magnus. Hmm. Stranger things have happened. Um... So is this Dark Storm is sad here, bro? Eric, wait, have you had the Talisker Dark Storm? I'd be curious if you know anything about this. So as it's sat here in a while, the vanilla, the vanilla thing is really popping out a lot more. But it's still got that sharp, peppery bite that you get off Talisker. This Dark Storm ain't bad. I, I wonder how old this is. I mean, those heavily charred oak, charred casks, Vague chart cast that they mentioned. Um, you know, it doesn't really, it might be masking a younger whiskey, spirity whiskey. I mean, considering how peaty this is, how smoky this is, I bet you this is a relatively young whiskey, and that those heavily charred oak casks that they uh, aged this in uh, are masking how young it is. Because it's there. I mean, I'm telling you, this is this is peaty and smokier than any Talisker I've had. Pretty good legs, too. Hmm. Well, I'm not a hater on NASs. I know some folks are like to be kind of, you know, judgy about them. I get, I get it that they can be hit and miss, but you know, my favorite. Whiskey, I think my favorite single malt of all time, especially the Ardbeg Ugadal is an NAS, and uh, you're not going to hear any complaints about that from me. So, take it for what it's worth. This is probably some young spirit in this Talisker Dark Storm. And these heavily charred oak casts are masking that. But I'll tell you, it's imparted a hell of a lot of flavor on it. And a Talisker that's this smoky, I mean, this is. This is solid. Next time you're going through duty free, man, give this one a second take. I'll give you, I'll tell you that much. It's pretty good. Eric Waite says, wow, nope, I bought the Joe Magnus in a local shop. Tomorrow, my Texas whiskey shopping video. Oh. This Texas whiskey. So I've heard a lot about this Texas, Texas whiskey phenomena. I know there's like a bunch of cats down there that are uh, that do videos about or that are from Texas and sing the praises of the Texas whiskey and whatnot. Um, I haven't had much. I know that uh, Balcones. Um, that's one that I've seen and to me the taste, but uh, I'll be definitely checking out your video, Eric. So since is all this Talister talk, I had to pour a 10-year-old in the first bottle. I'm like, oh, man. Cheers, Snearson. You know what? I'll put a little bit more of this Dark Storm so I can cheers you on that one. I think I did a video of the Telescope 10 a while back, and I might have hated on it a bit. I might have to revisit that. Like I told, like I said earlier, I think I've said it a couple times already tonight, Talisker is a distillery that has taken me some time to uh, warm up to. This was not one of my favorites, and it wasn't my it wasn't one that I enjoyed, quite frankly, 
the first three or four times I had it, I was just like, this is not for me. But that Distiller's Edition changed my mind, and uh, this Dark Storm is not doing bad either. Eric Waite said, I also got a bottle of Murray Hill Club bourbon whiskey. Also, I met Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. Is that a 375? You didn't get a 750 mil for 40 bucks, did you? That stuff's like $100. Have you had both of them? I'd be curious to hear, the, hear which one you, you thought was better. What was the bottle you asked me about earlier? Oh, the Dark Storm. So uh, I picked this up in Duty Free, this Tales for Dark Storm. I'm curious if you've had this one before. It's not bad. Seven hundred fifty mil for the Murray Hill Bourbon Club whiskey for forty dollars. What? <laughs> That's like free. This stuff is like eighty, ninety dollars. It's incredible, Eric. Damn, man. You can throw it. You should mail me one of those bottles. I'll pay shipping on it. It's stupid cheap. So Snurson, you said that the Talisker 10 is the first bottle of scotch you like you ever bought. What's the first? We got a few folks on. Um, would love to hear what your first bottles were, were of single malt. I mean, I suppose scotch in general, but single malt more specifically. My first was um, Oban 14. It was the first one that I got. It's for the longest time I thought it would be a repeat buy because I thought that it really like. Uh, it, it has a little bit of everything going for it. Um, the Oban 18 just really had this, like, or I'm sorry, the Oban 14. It just has this, like, it's like a nice crossroads. It, it reminds me, in the same way I would describe Highland Park 12, is that it's like kind of a nice crossroads of almost every style of scotch. Um, but the Oban 14 has, has just a little bit more going for it than the HP 12, maybe. Um, I don't know. Catch me on a different day, I might say HP 12, but HP 12 is cheaper too. Uh, but yeah, Open 14. But now I'm not sure if I would rebuy it. I, I've not, I've had the Open Little Bay, which I thought was really good. Uh, but that 14, yeah, that was my first bottle, and it'll always uh, that'll stick with me. That was the introduction to uh, the one that started it all. As a group. Christopher Davis says, "What the hell? I'm waiting for you to tell us that you saw the cigar blend. Also, just sitting on the shelf. Yeah, really." Seriously, so this is Eric Wade. Check out Austin's awesome evening. It's a great show. I meant that it was my first Talisker. We'd like to upgrade to the system. Oh, I got you. Okay. Got you. Yeah, the 10 was my first Talisker, too. Um, and that upgraded to Stiller's Edition. I know, seriously, if you're in California, you can get the Stiller's Edition for a good price. Just look online. You can, if you can't um, find it locally, or at least within state, you could probably get it shipped to you. It's still safe. That's a really good one. You can't go wrong with this, with the Talisker Distillers Edition, and it's interesting because you know when Diageo started doing those Distillers Editions, you know my skepticism flag got raised because you you just assumed it was going to be some ploy by them since they own like half the distilleries on the planet to uh, to be able to basically buy a bunch of the stuff or you know sell you a bunch of inferior stuff, and then the Distillers Editions have been great. Oh, Sirson's in Canada, not California. My bad, man. My bad. Where are you in Canada? That's right. You are in Canada. I remember that now because we had a conversation about this <laughs> a few months back on a quig on a quig uh, a quig live stream, and you mentioned that you were in Canada. Saskatchewan. Shit. Man. What's the weather like in Saskatchewan right now? I can imagine that you all got to be in that like high 50s, low 60s range. Eric Witt says, I wish. I was looking for the cigar blend. I'm drinking the Joe Magnus in my hotel over the next couple of days. I already reviewed the 750 mil during my bourbon month. I'm going to have to check that out, Eric. I live in Philadelphia right now uh, as of June. 
feels like a good snow season or something. But I moved up here uh, from D.C., uh, where I lived for the last three years, and I never had any of the Magnus stuff. I had some of the uh, Ivy City Gin, um, which is from the same place, but I did not have the Magnus. I've heard good things, though. I just could never, I could never pull the trigger on the, uh, it was like 98 to 100 bucks everywhere, everywhere I went in D.C., which isn't surprising for D.C. I could just never pull the trigger on it. Uh, but someday, right? I mean, there's always time to try new stuff. And we have a whole lifetime for that. I got a, a ton of new stuff here to try in and of itself already. So. We shall see. Um, and it's off to a good start. Uh, this Talisker Distillers Edition, or pardon me, this Talisker Dark Storm is making me second guess my criticism of some of the duty free stuff. Christopher David said, nice. I'm over in PA as well, south of York. Oh, shit, man. Where's York? I've only lived in Philly for two months, so I'm not familiar with everything is. Let's see where York is. Oh, okay. So you're south of Harrisburg. Oh, you're not that far. What's that, two hours, hour and a half? You're south of Harrisburg. Right on. Cheers, man. From one PA guy to another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Dark Storm. Hmm. I got to figure out a way to get to some more. Uh, I got to figure out a way to get, get myself to some more duty free shops without having to pay the price of going abroad. This message is held for review from your way now. Have you ever had any hate mail or trolls commenting on your channel? I'm getting douchebags up the wazoo making dumbass comments. <laughs> well, Eric, that's because you're a freaking superstar these days, man. How many subscribers do you have? I mean, I'm not I'm not nearly as big as you, man. I, I have a little uh I have a little tiny channel that I just kind of do my dumb two cents on, man. You're uh you got a lot more going for you. I've, you've been at this for a while and you're uh I mean, you've been doing like I mean, yeah. You got 3,000 subscribers. Shit. I'm one of them. <laughs> I can imagine, man, with with great uh, with great reach comes comes, you know, that's gonna come with the territory. Um, luckily I, I don't have that quite yet. I have I'm just shy of 200 subs. Um, I've only been at this for a little bit over a year. And it's been a lot of fun. Um, but I can imagine, so yeah, to be, to be, you know, long story short, I don't have too many, f I don't think I've had any issues with, definitely not with emails. Um, I'm trying to think back if I've had any trolls on live streams or anything. Don't recall. Um, I've had a few folks come on live streams that I think, um, some folks who had seen them on other live streams had said they were. They were kind of trolls, but they honestly didn't do much to set off any alarms for me. Um, so I haven't had really any issues. I might have had, there might have been one stream where I had somebody that was kind of, you know, being ridiculous. But I can imagine then that, you know, the bigger your channel gets, the more of that you're going to get. <laughs> you know, some of these people then, they got nothing better to do than just to, you know, come on and like spew garbage at folks. I wouldn't be surprised. So I hope that uh, I hope you're able to weed them out. I think you can block them relatively easily on YouTube. Um, you know, so if they're getting under your skin too much. If I keep going on my current, I'll hit 4K by the end of the year. But it's not about the subs; it's about enjoying, about learning about whiskey. And I'll drink to that, man. Cheers. I enjoy your stuff, man. And uh, I'm glad that you've been. I'm glad it's been growing, and uh, but I'm totally with you. You know, it's the same reason I do it. It's about really just learning and enjoying, and um, you know, it's fun to get on chats and kind of shoot the shit with folks who are who are also into it, and also to uh, you know share your own dumb two cents every once in a while about some of the stuff you're tasting. I mean, if you're going to be into it, it's it's all about kind of you know giving other folks the opportunity to to access it and not being a, a snobby uh, a snobby person about it. But yeah, you know, I know there are some folks out. Uh, who do videos that 
kind of have a you know a little bit of an ego about themselves. Um, so I try to keep myself modest, and I know you do too. Eric. So cheers, man. With that, I am going to uh, switch back over to this bourbon, which is awesome. Ah, seriously, this is true. It's great Eric Whitson and getting chicks because chicks dig bald bearded, fat middle aged men doing whiskey videos. Duh. I mean, the smart ones do, right? Jesus. <laughs> Those are the ones you want, man. The smart ones are probably all over it, you know. <laughs> you can save the flashy stuff for, the, for other folks, dude. You keep doing your thing. <laughs> it's too funny, man. It's too funny. So I'm going to be putting new, uh, what flavors in the flute? Well, for me, Elijah Craig, small batch, but it is a, no, it ain't a small batch. It's a store pick um, that I just finished up from a place called Randall's Wine and Spirits in Fairview Heights, Illinois. 11 year, 11 month age on this one. They did 114 bottles. It's proofed at 128.5. Oh, wow. Okay. Should know that. This is um, this is awesome. But it goes really well with what's in the vape, which is this is uh, Halo Tribeca, which is basically just kind of a smooth tobacco flavor. Um, really helped with the smoke quitting. And... Um, it's not too it's not too expensive either. Snearson says, "What flavors in the flute in the vape?" Oh yeah, yeah. Um, gotcha. It's the uh, yeah, it's the Halo Tribeca. I don't know if you vape at all. I would. You're looking for a good tobacco one. This one's good. Chris Ray is yeah, wrapping it. Keep the vis keep the videos coming. I just found the channel this week. I'm working my way through this. Oh man, cheers. I appreciate that, buddy. Yeah, I just started doing this out of fun. Um, I used to go on Whiskey Lives um, with Food Quig and a couple other folks, and I would just chat it up. And uh, it was right when I was starting to get into scotch, honestly. Um, I'd been into bourbon for a while, but I was getting into scotch, and I was like, I felt that I had kind of tasted enough stuff that, like, I started doing tasting notes just to kind of, like, remind myself what I like and what I'm looking for. And, um, Decided I'd just like, you know, start posting videos. You know, I don't take it too seriously. It's it's just kind of fun. Um, and, you know, if somebody comes across it and it helps them think about their decision on where they're at in their journey, then, like, that makes me super happy. So I'm glad to, I'm glad to have you with us, Christopher David. Slash you, buddy. And more to come. I got two more coming this month, at least. Um... I think the last one I posted was the Lafroy 25, which was just like a super lucky one that I got my hands on. Um, but uh, I've been doing a an 18 years or older thing this year. So every first review I post of the month is an 18 years or older scotch. And then um, at the end of the year, I'm going to do a top five of the ones I reviewed. Uh, the one that I'm doing for October, which will be recorded soon, it's going to be a hard one to beat, so <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll see how I feel at the end, but uh, stay tuned for that. Eric Waits is with and and it's called a Velvet Dick. <laughs> Christopher David says, what do you think about the bad press on vaping lately? All right. This is a really great topic. Because I've, of course, been thinking about this and seeing this a lot. Here's what I think. A couple things. First and foremost, media in this country is a for-profit industry. Therefore, especially in the age of the internet, um, sensationalism, uh, clickbaity stuff is is what they have to go for in order to get people to pay attention um 
we can leave aside critiques about media and why people need to pay more attention in general. But specifically, in the age of the internet, I think that that's a big, a big thing. Secondly, I think because we live in an industry, a, a media culture now where uh, it's all about clicks and social media posts and not necessarily about in-depth journalism, we just don't have the same level of journalism in most places that we did, say, 20 years ago. Um, I really think because of that, we don't see the same quality level of journalism in a lot of places uh, in the mainstream news that we used to. Um, and this vaping thing is a classic example. So the way that they talk about vaping is first and foremost, let me say off the bat, the issue around the increase in teenagers vaping and using electronic cigarettes, that's a serious public health issue. I totally am in agreement that like whatever can be done to like get the message across that like young people, specifically like teenagers, should not get themselves addicted to nicotine. That's a fucking fact because nobody in their right mind at an adult age would pick up smoking of any sort. It happens when you're young. Um, at least smoking cigarettes and vape, in my opinion. Um, as far as the Brad Press goes, yeah, it's it's alarming because we are seeing all of these incidents suddenly, very suddenly, of like people getting very bad lung diseases, dying even. Um, but it's a super small sample size. I mean, we're talking about what a couple hundred people. That's a, that's an epidemic. That's a crisis. But it's not like you know it, it presents itself in a way that shocks you. But like, how many people are out there vaping that aren't having any issues? Um, I think that the main issue with the vaping stuff is that it's not talking of the, the news coverage so far. It's not talking about what kind of vaping they're doing. So some of the articles, if you dig deep enough, will talk that like a lot of the reporting of the people who are having issues have been vaping specific types of THC oils. So not necessarily like, um, you know, nicotine vape oils. And a lot of these issues might be coming from THC. Um, I wish that that was getting a little bit more prominence in the news reporting of this because I feel like it would alleviate some of the fear that some people have about like vaping in general. Um, but uh, that said, you know, the jury's been out on this. This is not FDA approved. It is not, there's not a ton of research on it. We don't know what the long term effects are. Reason states that it's not as bad as cigarettes, which I think is still true. Um, I just wish that, yeah, I wish the media coverage would be a little bit more specific about like, are they using Juul or not? Are they, are these coming from people who are smoking THC or not? Some of the articles I've read way down in like paragraph nine are saying many of these have been reported as canna cannabis related. Um, and so that's my two cents on it. Um, proceed with caution. You know, uh, I just think that it's a little bit, it's a little bit sensational to make vaping sound like a total epidemic when A, the media doesn't have all the facts and B, the facts that they do have seem to be pointing towards people having specific issues with cannabis related ones. Um, that all said, if you're vaping now to quit cigarettes, continue, but be smart and thoughtful about where you buy your oils. Don't buy it from people who make it at home. Don't buy it from, you know, Johnny on the corner. Uh, don't buy it if it has diacetyl in it. And if you're vaping off THC oils, I'd be even more cautious. But outside that, you know, like, let's be, let's be thoughtful. That's the way I put it. So the, I, I vape because I'm quitting smoking cigarettes. Um, based on everything I've read and the way the news is, I think this is still, while not an ideal situation, um, a safer situation. Um, and if science and logic and facts prove that wrong, um, I will take that into consideration when making my choices. Right now, I think the jury's out. And uh, 
the sensational media cycle that we're going through right now about these really horrendous, horrible issues. Um, I'm not yet sure if it has to do with what I'm doing, but rather the choices that some folks have been making around other stuff. So like, that's, that's kind of my two cents on it. Um, I don't want to harp on this too long, but um, yeah. So, you know, if you don't do it, don't start. <laughs> and if you do do it, you know, try and be as smart about it as you can. Um, Snearson says rabbit and red is a credit to the whiskey too. Yeah. Hey, cheers, man. Um, yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I love this man. I love the uh, I love the community. I love you know shooting the shit with y'all about whiskey. It's always fun. Um, I don't take myself too seriously. I don't think I'm some freaking expert. <laughs> I just I I just started making videos because I thought it was a lot of fun and that I had something to contribute. And um, I appreciate y'all's uh, feedback and I'm glad y'all are uh, you know checking out my stuff and 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 leaving all your comments and things. You know, it's super cool. It's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, you know, it keeps me going, and I'm learning a lot from you, uh, maybe even more from y'all than uh, than I would have if I didn't do the videos. So, if anything, it's been a it's been a way to a conduit to even further learning and exploration on this fun journey. So, it's been cool. Christopher David said, uh, "Oh, message redacted from Eric Wait." Christopher David said, "At Whiskey Sears, and I agree." Sure says, thanks for, I completely agree with you. I love to hear your educator's thoughts. Oh, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, I watched the news last week and I realized everything I was going to do kills me. Oh, well, yeah, man. You know, I mean, look, you know, I'm not even, I mean, I'm not even getting political with it. Like, the media is the media. I'm not, you know, I don't subscribe to these concepts of fake news and all that. But, like, the media, you know, the most important thing I always remember, and it's one of the things I learned in college that I remember is correlation does not equal causation, right? So any day you can turn on the news or read the newspaper or read an article, you're going to see something that says like, new study says coffee makes you live until you're 100. New study says coffee makes you die at 60. You know, like shit like that. Like correlation's not causation, you know? Um, just because there's a relationship between two variables doesn't mean that they ca one causes the other. It's a spectrum. It's about like understanding, it's about, you know, science is about the ability to be predictive and replicate, replicable. Like, the, you know, you turn on the local news, man, whatever some new study comes on that can fill five minutes of their airtime, they're going to tell you about it. And people are be like, oh, great, I can drink 55, you know, uh, coffees every morning because this new study said that coffee is going to make me live to 100. And then there's another one that says, you know, coffee may lead to heart failure in certain people. It's just like, and you don't know what's good. And Twitter and Facebook are worse. Christ, we can get into that. But, you know, man, be an independent thinker. Think for yourself. Question things. Do the homework. Do the research if you care about the things that you're thinking about. And, uh, you know, more times than not, it'll lead you to a healthy a healthy skepticism, a healthy kind of thought process on how to deal with this. Eric Ward says, post hoc ergo propter hoc, right? Latin for correlation does not equate to causation. You are 100% right, my friend. Let's change the subject. What has been the best new whiskey to you that you have had this year? So here's the thing. The only way I can really talk about that is in this in the con is is with a qualifier. And the qualifier is is a whiskey that I tried for the first time this year. So are you asking me what whiskey did you have for the first time this year that like could have come out at any time that is your favorite? Or is it like what whiskey that came out this year is your favorite? Because being in Pennsylvania with the way the liquor laws are, I'm very much retracted. Uh, <laughs> I have a different, I, it's very reduced in my ability to try as many new things as I used to when I was in DC. But, um, so that's an important question. And then I, I think I might have an answer. Oh, this is correct. Okay, so new to you, come out at any time. So I will do a video of my top five whiskeys of 2019, and it will include my whiskey of the year. But, 
if I had to throw out a couple, so I'll give you a couple that I think I had for the, that I had for the first time this year that I think were um, notable and things I would buy again. Before I get eighteen, Glen Gary twelve. Um, Glen Morn G. Spios. Um, Una Haven 18. Mm. Glen Dronic 18 Allardyce. Um, Lefroy Karches 2019 Triple Wood or the Triple Wood Cast Ring. I got a couple. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert, some of those may end up on my 2019 Whiskey of the Year top five, which I'll post in December. Oh, Lafroy 25. Brook Lottie Blackheart 4.1. So I got a, I got a decent amount. <laughs> so it's very hard uh, to say which one is the best. I think that like if I take into account cost and accessibility, I could narrow that down a little bit. But um, best I can do for you right now is that somewhat unabridged list. <laughs> I think uh, I think there's there's no shortage of good stuff. Um, another one that I would add on there. Um, oh shit, I just forgot it now. Glen Morangy, or not Glen Morangy, um, Yellow Spot. Irish, 12 year. Um, oh man, it's. I've had a couple others that I haven't done reviews of that, like, I had uh, the Blanton straight straight from the barrel. I had that on New Year's Day. Yeah, there's a couple. Was it New Year's or Christmas Day? I don't remember. <laughs> uh, which is probably a testament to its its greatness. But. Um, nice list. Yeah, cheers, man. I'd love to hear what yours were. I mean, um, still got some folks viewing, so I'd love to hear what, uh, what whiskeys y'all have had this year that have been the, the ones that have stuck with you. Um, this year has really been a year for me of like going into older stuff that I could afford. Um, there's been a few in specific that I had that, yeah, you know, like I mentioned that, you know, older ones that I don't, you know, I don't ever want to get to a point where I'm only going to like do reviews of whiskeys that are inaccessible. Like, I think that that's, first of all, I think that like, by no means am I done trying whiskeys that are younger because I think that each one is its own unique experience and that you have the opportunity to try something really new and you, you know, new and, uh, and learn something from everything you get the opportunity to drink. Um, but you know, I did move a little bit into older stuff this year. Um, so some of my lists might reflect that. Snooze says, do you guys get Subum's VO'd on there? Been into slightly fruity communities. Seagram's, oh yeah. Seagram's, the Seagram's VO, I think, yeah, that's, let me just double check. I mean, I know the Seagram's 7 is. Yeah. Yeah, Seagram's VO is something I'm definitely doing. I can't say I've had this. A blend of over 50 separate whiskey. This is from Total Wine. A blend of over separate 50, uh, separate, Whiskeys, 50. They have an age in a minimum of six years. Gold with a light amber glow, medium body, reminiscent of pear, caramel, butter, and brown spices. Slightly coarse texture, complemented by soft brown spices. I have not had that. But it is uh, it is definitely in the United States. Eric, wait. I'm going to go live at the top of the hour. 10 Eastern, 9 Central, 7 Pacific. Well, what about Mountain Time? All right, man. I'll definitely hop on and say hi to you. Christopher David says it whiskey Sneerson. I have not had the whiskey, but I will tell you that Crown Royal Peach can't stay 
on the freaking shelves down here. Never had it, and I don't know what the hype is. Where are you, Christopher David? Because I'm going to be telling you right now, Crown Royal Peach sounds awful. <laughs> that sounds awful. I hope I'm wrong, but it sounds awful. Snearson said, uh, would be considered a mix. I dilute it with quite a bit of water. Yeah, man. You know, Canadian... I did have a Canadian whiskey for the first time this year. And I think it would make the list. Lot 40, not the cast strength. I know you can't get the cast strength from the States. And I would give my left hand for somebody to send me a sample of the cast strength. Hint, hint, hint. If y'all get it, uh, hit me up at rabbit and red 78 at gmail.com. Would love to talk some sample swaps if you have the cast strength lot 40. But outside that, um, haven't had a ton of different, uh, have not had a ton of different um, Canadians whiskeys. Really. Um, it's something that I kind of got to work my way into. Uh, it's just not been anything I want to do. Um, Click Daily UK. Hello, I'm new to your channel. Want to know, want to know something. Well, what's up, Click Daily? Nice to have you here. Uh, I'm assuming you want to know something. Okay. Uh, we'll wait for your question. Uh, glad for glad you're joining us tonight. I was watching you 30 minutes. I was watching you for 30 minutes now. Cool. Christopher Davis says, Sam Bob. Well, I might have to. Um, we'll see. Unless they have something interesting to say. I'm not quite sure. And I want to know, want to know what spam is. What is spam? Is. Um, spam is sending same messages. Yeah, uh, that's definitely true. Hmm. Over 1,000 of the same message. <laughs> okay. That's a spam. Yeah. I mean, I think we get that click daily. Um, your name, though, I have to say, if you're not spam, your name is definitely a little bit on the spammy side. Um, yeah. So, anyways, um, man, I gotta do something about this chair. It is really squeaky. Sadly, I've killed off my Elijah Craig store pick, which, full disclosure, was amazing. Um, the, I think Elijah Craig's 12 year barrel proof is one of the best. Probably one of the best bourbons you can get for the money. If not, one of the best bourbons you can get, period. But um, every once in a while, you find these liquor stores here in the U.S. We have you live on our YouTube channel, taking live up. We had to say goodbye to our quick daily friend. Um, I think that they are uh, most certainly a spam bot. Customs is draconian up here. I would not risk sending or receiving anything. It's that bad. I don't like that happen, Robert. Lot for the next time I'm in traveling the states. I don't know. Oh, man, I feel you. Um, I actually, uh, I've had similar conversations with Foodquake, who's in. Um, who I knew you know, who's in Vancouver, British Columbia, and does have, uh, you know, similar issues regarding the the custom stuff in Canada. I know it can be a bit challenging. Um, but I think ultimately, 
you know, if you're ever here in the States, let's do it. You let me know um, and we'll figure out a way to do it. Anyways, um, I think I'm going to probably get ready to wrap up here relatively quick. We might do one more for this dark storm. Uh, uh, French, oh, French Keister. <laughs> French Keister's back there, it says fuck customs. Yeah, fair enough, man. Um, you know, uh, they got to do their job, and some of their job is really important. I do think some of the liquor laws can be a Probably be liberalized and relaxed a little bit, but uh, you know, we'll uh, fight that battle when we can. I put quite a dent in this uh, cows for dark storm. Um, the customs in the U.S., like I was saying earlier, is kind of a, a labyrinth to figure out in terms of like what you can bring in carry on versus what you can bring in duty free, or what you can bring in check bag versus what you can do. Is like duty free carry on versus what you can bring as regular carry on versus how much, and then like what do you need to report, and then like you know it depends a lot on what the custom customs agent or uh, the customs official asks you. Um, it, can be a, it can be a little bit confusing, um, but you know ultimately, like I said, if you're traveling abroad, bring. Uh, bring a bag that you check if you're in the United States because I think it's the best way to like a be able to carry as much as you know as much as you think you can home and uh, Customs seems to be more lenient on the carry-on than they are on the, or not on the carry-on uh, the check bag than they are on the carry-on I'm doing a little bit more of the storm storm here Christopher David <laughs> French Keister says fuck us. Yeah, Christopher David says it was Keister and that sucks Whiskey Sanderson says Customs had me bend over a few times with international cigars. Shit. I hope you're not talking about literally. <laughs> I really hope you're not talking about literally. Because that would be really unfortunate. Eric Waite said, uh, I have traveled abroad, but her high heels didn't fit me. This guy, man, he's a freaking comedian. <laughs> you silly dude. I love you, Eric Waite. We should do a show sometime together, Eric Waite. Because I'm also Eric with a K, by the way. I know that my like my name uh, here on YouTube doesn't uh, doesn't say that, but I am also Eric with a K. We could literally do an Eric and Eric double. It's like a double maturation, a double cast, if you will. We could literally do that. We should do it sometime. Get in touch with me, Rabbit in Red seventy eight at Gmail. Or I can email you. Well, we should do an Eric and Eric and Eric show, man. I've actually had, I've, you know, finally now that I'm like got a few subscribers, I've had people ask me what the rabbit and red thing is all about. So, um, for y'all, when I originally created the channel, I'm a big horror movie fan, classic horror movies, and so Rabbit in Red was the name of the bar that was on a book of matches in the original Halloween. Movie. So this nurse is smoking, she drops them, and she drops the matches, and it says Rabbit in Red Lounge. And it, it's, a, it's a foreshadowing uh, device in the movie because later in the movie you see that and you know that uh, the killer in the movie, Michael Myers, had killed, uh, had killed him because she, they find the, the, the Rabbit in Red thing. So I was originally going to do Rabbit in Red as a horror movie channel. Um, and then I decided I'm going to do it as a horror and whiskey channel, and there was kind of a connection because you know it's called bar and the lounge and whatever. And now it's just become just whiskey. Um, so I've just rolled with it. <laughs> yeah. But that's it. We could totally do an uh, an Eric and Eric show, Eric. Wait, um, we should we should figure out a time to do that sometime. That'll be a lot of fun. Oh, you said we, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. let's do it. Whiskey Snearson says, "Bam." Whiskey uh, Christopher Davis said, "Are you ordering from Europe?" This is in Europe and Hong Kong. Oh, wow, man. So, Snearson, you know a thing or two about cigars. Like to have to be ordering from... Uh, yeah, I don't know what the laws are in Canada. 
it seems like an unfortunate amount of work you have to go through. But, you know, in my conversations with Food Quig, he's who's over in British Columbia, he's he's told me that Canada, you know, um, for all its virtues, definitely has some uh, some issues that you have to work through specifically regarding uh, liquor laws and um, uh, customs. So that can be kind of a bummer. All right, y'all. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, be sure to, you know, if you're still on YouTube later, apparently Eric Waits going live in about 40 minutes. So we can all head to his channel and check it out. But thanks for joining me, man. Um, appreciate you, uh, you all sharing the drama with me tonight here on this Wednesday. And uh, I'm going to catch y'all next time. Uh, keep an uh, eye. If you haven't hit the subscribe button, you know, please do or share with your friends. I should have a new uh, whiskey review video coming up really soon. Uh, great sharing drams with you all, man. Cheers, friends. I'll catch you next time.